Okay, just breathe. A few more steps. <sighs> How did you get that idea? You're not even fit. <sighs> Where's your summit anyway? Okay, a few more steps. <sighs> oh, these hiking boots are killing me. I just wanted to look good on this trip. So I went to the store and bought the coolest boots that I could see, but they're way too small and not even waterproof. Oh my God. <sighs> are we there yet? <sighs> To make a long story short, I made it to the highest summit of Iceland that day, 12 years ago. And when we arrived there, the weather was so bad that we couldn't find the way down. I was wet, I was cold, and I was hungry. But after one hour, we found the way, and we got started our descent. And I absolutely crawled the last meter to the car. I was exhausted. I had been... 20 hours in my first hiking trip. <laughs> and this was my first personal victory for a very, very, very long time. And it boosted up my ego. But at that time, I had a very, very broken self-esteem. I didn't understand the terms of goals, and I had no dreams about myself and the future. The only thing that I had achieved at this moment well, if you can call it achievement, because it's something that you're not really proud of, is I had been kicked out of school three times before I was 18. Impressive, eh? <laughs> <No>. <laughs> but that day, something changed. I wanted to learn more, and I signed up for a two years training in a certain rescue team. And because I was always out in the nature, my comfort zone expanded. And because I was kind of good at it, I gained self-contents. And after two years, I graduated. That was the first time ever that I finished a project, wasn't kicked out with the shame. <laughs> and after that, I was certainly ready to get some education. And in the end, I even managed to graduate from university, despite what people had said before. And during that training, one more thing happened. I read a book. I read a book about the South Pole Expedition, and I was absolutely fascinated. You could be out there skiing for days, and the only thing you needed is what was on your sled. So it's a very simple way of living, and I was fascinated by that. But I also wanted to touch the steel pole that is located at the South Pole, you know, the icon. But at that time, I didn't have enough knowledge, I didn't have enough experience, and I had no idea of how to raise the money to get there, because it's really expensive. But I never stopped dreaming about it, and I never forgot it, and I encourage you to daydream, because if you do that, you're traveling in your mind into situations and on destinations that you really, really, really want to be in. And if you daydream enough about it, you actually might end up going there. But it wasn't until this day that I took the decision and I set myself a goal. And I was leading an expedition across Vatnajökull Ice Cap, the largest one in Europe. And this was on day four, and we were absolutely stuck. The weather was horrible, and we had to stay on shift to dig the snow from the tent so it wouldn't be buried underneath. And I was laying there in my tent, having a cozy time, and I was daydreaming. And it hit me like a lightning. And I said, Willa, you're just ready. Now you have to go home and prepare your own trip to the South Pole. And that is what happened. I went home, Googled a little bit, and wrote the first email. I had made the decision, and I was going to make my dream come true. And I sometimes describe it, it's just like falling in love. You get so absolutely obsessed with your project. It's the first thing you think about in the morning. And you're always cheating at work, like what's going on at the South Pole. You think about it during the night, and you dream about it. There's no other option than going. But it was a big project, and I was afraid of failing. So I didn't really tell anyone about it. And I even just told my mom two months before departing. But if you don't tell anyone, it's so easy just to quit. So what I did, 
I called a friend, a polar explorer, and actually one of the guys that I read about in the book earlier on, and I told him about it. And the reason for I chose him was I never ever wanted him to ask me, hey Willa, why did you never ski to the South Pole? Nope, that was not gonna happen. But when you take on an expedition like that, you need to prepare. You need to prepare physically and mentally because when you have to face the difficulties of the trip, it's easy to fail or stop if you're not ready. So I, I read a lot of books and blogs and I tried to visualize every possible situation that I knew that could happen out on the ice. But I also decided to find my own personal values. And most of us, we have values. We want to be honest, hardworking, and so on. But it's different if we, want to, if we have defined them. And when you do that, you need to face yourself, and you need to find your strength, and you need to find your weakness. And remember, your weakness is not going to make you less of a person. You're just going to grow as soon as you know to learn it and work with it. And my biggest weakness that can affect me on an expedition is how spontaneous I am. I sometimes just make decisions and follow it through. But out there, I always need to be making good decisions. So in the end, I chose those three, valu three values. And the first one is positivity. When you're preparing an expedition like that, you need to be extremely positive because you're going to get at least 50 no's before you get the first yes. And you need to believe in yourself, and you need to believe in your project, no matter what other people think or say. And the second one is determination. I was going to stay out there on the ice all alone, so if I wouldn't do the work, nobody would do it for me, and I would never reach my goal. And I had also been told that it would be really hard to get up in the morning. And yes, it was. Imagine, you wake up in your tent, it's freezing outside, and the only sound you can hear is the wind blowing on your tent. So it's quite tempting just to go a little bit further into your sleeping bag and keep on cuddling. But if you do that, you're not going to reach your goal. And on day four, it was bothering me a lot. I wasn't performing as well as I should be. So I wrote in my tent, above where I was sleeping, if you snooze, you lose. And that's the way it is. And the third one is courage. That stands for two things. The first one is to follow your heart. And that is what I needed to do. I had just been hired for a very good job. And I was enjoying life after university, you know. But I decided to go for it. And I don't regret that today. I might not have assets, but I have memories that you can't put price tag on, and I have learned things that you can't learn from books. And it also stands for dealing with the danger out there on the ice. And sometimes it's not only dangerous things, sometimes it is things that we are uncomfortable dealing with. But if we don't deal with them, we are never going to reach our goals. We're not going to get anywhere. And today, my values are my mantra. If I feel low, if I'm negative, or not performing as I should be, I think about them, why they choose them, and what they mean to me, and without a doubt, I can talk myself into a better place. This is Antarctica. The um, way the road that I ski, or not the road, the track that I went to, is 1140 kilometers, and the sleds are over 100 kilos in the beginning and you can see the, uh, the red arrow on the map. And there are very few things that welcome you when you arrive in Antarctica. It's freezing cold, and the wind is blowing your face the whole way. There are animals that live by the coast, like seals and penguins and birds, but the birds don't even fly inland because there's nothing there for them. It's the coldest and windiest continent on the whole Earth. But I also call it the land of freedom, because when you arrive, it's summer. So there's no difference between day and night. So you have to choose your own time zone, 
and live by that the whole way. So guess what you do if you accidentally sleep in? Yeah, you just change the time zone and you're back on track. No problem. <laughs> I landed by the horror zone and I started to ski immediately. And it's kind of hard in the beginning because you need to ski up the glacier that you land on. The slats, 100 kilos, and you put on a lot of weight before you go on an expedition like that. So you're skiing slowly, and there's no time to get used to or adapt to the situation because you start by skiing into a crevasse belt, you know, glacier crevasses. And when this picture is taken, I had been skiing for four hours. I was looking back, and I had just crossed my first crevasse. It's about one and a half to two meters wide, and it stretches kilometers each direction. And I just needed to pick with my skiing pole, and if this would happen, I knew it wouldn't be safe, and I would have to find a new way, because there's a very, very deep hole underneath that I could easily fall in. But both in life and out there on this ice, if you desire something badly enough, you will find the way, otherwise you will just find the excuse. Yeah, looking good. <laughs> Adaptability. We can adapt to pretty much everything. Changes at work, changes at school, changes in our personal life. And we can adapt to live alone in Antarctica. I just knew that I needed some time. I had been told 10 days. If I would stick through the first 10 days, I would most likely be able to finish the expedition. But oh boy, it was not the easiest 10 days in my life. My face was swollen, my eyes were leaking, and I was freezing cold. But after 10 days, my face did not look like that anymore, and Antarctica was becoming more and more like home to me. So this is my camp. I woke up every morning at 6 o'clock. My first priority was to turn on the stove because I needed to melt water for the day three liters, and one liter for breakfast and coffee. After two and a half hours, I was ready to go outside to ski. On average, I would ski for 10 hours. If I was working extra hard, I would ski for 12 hours. And then I need to put up my camp again. It would take me maybe 40 minutes to finish my evening routine, to put up the tent, get some snow for melting water, and so on. And then I would go in, turn on the stove, melt some water, have dinner, send one blog post through my satellite phone, and then I was so tired, I'd just have to go to sleep. Because I had been working constantly from 6 o'clock in the morning to 9.30 in the evening, and there's never a break. And that's how it goes for 60 days in a row. But it's good, because then you don't have time to get lonely. And of course, I got a little bit homesick in the beginning, especially when I called home and I heard from my parents that they were worried about me out there on the ice but you can't let it get too deep to you because you need to keep focused the whole way. This map represents how big the project is. The star in the corner is the South Pole, and my starting point isn't even on the map. And when you have a big goal like that, you need to divide it into smaller goals. You can imagine how it feels when you turn on your GPS and you're not even on the map yet, and you have 1,062 kilometers to go. It's almost impossible th to think about it that way. So in the beginning, I wasn't on the way to the South Pole. I was just on the way to the first latitude on my map, <coughs> because I knew I would be able to reach there. And always, when I reached the latitude, I would celebrate. Maybe have a hot cup of cocoa or something simple, but I would celebrate. And if it was a question about if I would reach the latitude that day, I would work harder until I would reach it and would be able to celebrate. And if you celebrate many small goals, you will celebrate the big goal in the end. That's the way it goes. Yeah, this is what we call sastrugis, or snow waves. And on the last third part of the way, I skied into extreme conditions. This one, is my height, and some of them were even up to two meters, and it was so overwhelming. I needed to use all my values, positivity, determination, and courage, and simply not lose it. It was so hard. But I decided 
to ski at least my minimum distance, 20 kilometers. But if, because if you deal with the problems, the sooner you will get into a better place and I was going to get there as soon as possible. And because I did that, it only took me a week. It was 150 kilometers. 150 kilometers of extreme sastrugis. And do you know what I thought positive about that? When I was really talking myself into it? Yeah. The fact that I only needed to ski once across each and every one, but not twice. So there's always something positive <laughs> if you think about it long enough. <laughs> but due to that fact and to a terrible bad weather conditions, the trip took me 10 days longer than I had expected. And I was going to go solo and unsupported, but I ended up finishing my on my food, so I needed to get resupplies, and I lost my unsupport status. Yeah, that's something, if you're an athlete, that you really don't like. But I would never ever like to exchange my experience, of the experience of skiing and actually reaching to the South Pole in one of the hardest conditions of last year. I would never, last years, I would never like to exchange that and for 50 days in good conditions, because I learned more, I gained more experience, I'm more capable of taking on to bigger tasks, and I learned more about myself. And sometimes we just have to remember when we are facing some unsuspected situation in our project, that in the long term we will gain for it, even though it's not always fun while it's happening. To take good care of you is the key. It's a key to a success, both in personal life, in your interests, at work and out there on the ice. When I took this picture, it's maybe below 40, but it just protected my face. And I need to eat because if I don't get the energy, I'm not able to finish and there's nobody out there who's going to help me. And I need to respect my resting time because if I don't rest, I'm never going to finish my project. So take good care of yourself. This picture is taken on the 17th of January last days, last year. I had been out there for two months, skiing all alone. And I'm so happy because I'm going out for my last day. I had seen the pole station for the first time the day before. And that was the first time that I knew I was going to reach my goal. I was going to become a polar explorer. So I've never been as fast going out as this morning. And when I got there, I didn't see a thing. It was a complete whiteout. So there's no difference between the sky and the earth and no horizon at all. It's like skiing in a glass of milk. <laughs> so I just ski toward the pole and I didn't feel much in the beginning. But at two o'clock, it cleared up and I could see the pole station again. And I was so close to it. And I just entered this crazy emotional roller coaster. And I got tears in my eyes, and then I started to cry. And before I knew, I was crying really out loud, just like this <laughs> towards the pole station. But you get so emotional. I had been thinking about it for 10 years. I had put my life and soul into it for one and a half years. And I had sacrificed pretty much everything that I had, and now I was getting closer to the pole in every step. But when I had cried a little bit, I started to laugh. <laughs> because I was so tired. <laughs> and tomorrow I could sleep in, have some rest. But after laughing a little bit, I started to cry again. <laughs> and now I was really sad. I just found out that the camp that the logistic company puts up on the South Pole had been taken down the day before. And that meant when I would reach to the pole, when I would finish my goal, 
there would be nobody there to celebrate with me. There would be anyone there to give me a clap on the back. And the worst thing of all, there was nobody there to give me a hug. That's the only thing you want when you have been alone for such a long time and when you have worked so hard. Just that someone will give you a hug. And that was not going to happen. So I skied towards the pole and I felt sorry for myself and I cried the whole way. But when I had four kilometers left, I had to notify the logistic company that was entering the pole area. And when I did that, I found out there were four guys from South Africa at the pole waiting for my arrival. <laughs> and I got so happy. <laughs> Well, first of all, I hadn't seen four guys for over 60 days. <laughs> <laughs> but beside that, there would be some other. I didn't know them, but that didn't matter at that time. <laughs> so I pulled my face together, and I made sure that the guys would not see that I had totally lost the cool and cried half of the way. And when I was ready, I skied the last four kilometers into the pole. And I stopped just outside the tent, and I asked if anybody home. And they jumped outside, and we started to talk and bounded immediately. And before I knew, one of the guys, he stepped forward and said, I just have to give you a hug. <laughs> and I was so happy. I was still on my skis, I was still tied into my sled, and I just jumped into his arms, <laughs> and I hold so tight, and I didn't want to let go. It was the best hug I ever had, and it's really embarrassing when you don't even know the guy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was good, and he will always be my friend. <laughs> but then I put up my tent, I called home, and after two hours, I was ready. I was ready for my big moment, to ski into the South Pole itself. It only took me five minutes to go from my tent, but I didn't want it to end. I didn't want to take the last steps, because you know, when you get there, it's over. It's the love of your life, it's your baby, sort of, and you don't want it to end. So I skied slowly, and I stopped next to the pole, waited a little bit, and when I was ready, I raised my hand and put it on top of the bowl, just like I wanted to do for the past 10 years. And I was finally there. And I can't really describe for you how I was feeling, but I thought I was going to explode over it all. It was so amazing. And for me, it was worth of every penny, every minute, and every step. And I would do it all over again. And all goals don't need to be big as that. Maybe you want to run 10 Ks, how to play a, learn how to play a guitar, or apply for a new job but just to set yourself a goal and work towards it until you reach it makes you a winner. And I just want to end by saying that if you have a dream or if you want to set yourself a goal, it's always, always, always worth it. No matter what other people think. Thank you. Go ahead. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> you guys are amazing. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.